What's up, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to yet another Sales Hacker webinar. You already know me, it's Gaetano. I run marketing at Sales Hacker. Uh, I wanna get right to the point here. Let's introduce our guests. Uh, we have Jack, say what up, Jack, and introduce yourself. Yeah, Jack Kozakowski, excited to be here. Uh, CEO at Creation Agency and a uh, connoisseur of all things social selling. Exactly, exactly. And of course, uh, our, our very special guest for today, uh, Will Frattini from Zoom Info. Welcome, uh, Will. Thanks, Gaetano. Nice to be here, Jack. Nice to be here as well. Awesome. All right, so for the attendees, real quick, uh, I just want to let you know that this is being recorded. So if you're worried about missing anything or you got to frantically take notes because you think you missed a little value bomb from Jack or Will, um, don't worry, we're gonna uh, send the recording to you in an email follow-up. And then of course, subscribe to us on YouTube uh, so that you can get the recording there as well. So let's just dive right into it. This is gonna be fire, fireside chat style. Um, we're gonna get into a lot of different topics regarding social selling and how it impacts the pipeline and bottom line, of course. Um, and if you have questions along the way, go ahead and drop them into the chat box. We'll get them in there as much as we can, I promise. And then at the end, of course, we'll have time for Q&A. Um, Let's just get right to the point, guys. What is this social selling stuff going on? Is there a definition of it? A lot of people say it's this. A lot of people say it's that. I know I have my own definition of it, but I mean, let's let's get to Will first. Uh, Will, you are, are the senior manager of new business sales at Zoom Info. What is social selling uh, from your lens? Yeah, so for us, social selling at Zoom Info, we've thought a lot about how we can be more personalized and more relevant and more timely and being able to kind of connect the dots with folks while they're promoting or engaging with content on social media is, is helping us to engage them. Because even though we have a super awesome value uh, for our customers, sometimes it's not enough to just pitch who we are and what we do. And mm -hmm. so social selling allows us to be able to say, this person is probably gonna be somebody that our message could resonate with. And if we custom cater it a little bit, that helps get the reply that much more often. Nice, I love it. Jack, I, I know you're you're very passionate about this subject. How, how would you define it? Well, I think you know a lot of people have to understand that you have uh, different types of sales methodologies, right? You got the challenger sale, you've got agile selling, you, you know, the list goes on. So, uh, you know, you've got a lot of different processes, methodologies that people are incorporating into their sales process, probably taking a little bit of each one and kind of making it their own. And I think social selling kind of just falls into that you know, one of those pieces, which is, you know, I look at it the most simple way is how are you using social to create, strengthen, and influence sales conversations, you know, throughout the sales process, right? Where a lot of people, I think, get mixed up because they think it's just prospecting, but really you've got so many different ways you can leverage social and, you know, it's just got to be part of your toolkit. I mean, if you, we need every communication channel. We we need every communication channel that there is to, to reach our buyers and, and create, you know, better, conversations with insights from from their from their voice yeah yeah I totally agree and I mean in terms of like how salespeople should be thinking about social from a more practical standpoint you, you have like advice from Gary Vee and all these people like you know if you're not creating video and, and content for, for Instagram and uh, LinkedIn and then Quora and Medium and all these places it's like you know I get that but it does sound a little bit disjointed in, in some ways coming from the 10,000 foot view so from a practical standpoint maybe Will you can take a stab at this first like how do you position this to your sales reps in a way that's not going to seem uh, fragmented or disjointed and how are you going to get them rolling uh, with social selling um, in a more sort of meticulous and process driven manner? I, I think we live in a world where people aren't afraid to speak up and voice their opinions and, and put ideas out into the world via social. And I think mm -hmm. smart, intelligent sales and marketing professionals like everybody on this webinar and you know Jack and yourself, I mean, we know that if you can strike when the iron's hot, you're going to be successful. And I think we've got some great examples here where if you look in the right place, we used the sales hacker community just recently as an example on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And we found someone posted something about something that's relevant to Zoom Info's audience. A couple people engaged with that content. One was very comfortable saying, this is super relevant to me. And, you know, sure enough, a nice timely message and saying, hey, look, I, I care about what you care about. Here's something I think we should talk about. Mm -hmm. um, it allowed us to get a meeting that we probably wouldn't have gotten just via email or phone, right? Yeah. Uh, no matter how good our data is on them, right? Like to be able to be relevant at that point in time. 
Um, mm. There's no silver bullet that that always works, but you know, it certainly helps us, like I said, be more timely and kind of boost up the ability to know what people care about and actually take action on it. Exactly. Exactly. Jack, what's your thoughts, man? So, you know, you've got a lot of these guys like Gary Vee, who's got a massive budget, right? I mean, Gary Vee can easily, you know, be Gary Vee because he's got millions of ad dollars and ad spend and books and stuff. So your average sales rep, they're not gonna they're not gonna be allowed to do what Gary Vee does, right? right? So I think this is kind of like the misconception of like separating um, personal branding and social selling, because you know if you're just an average sales rep or an SDR at a company or or, or a sales you know, account executive, you don't have the luxury to be able to spend your time creating content in most cases. Um, should you? I, you know, maybe, right? Have your marketing team support you. But I mean, at the end of the day, it comes about, I look at it this way, is an outbound approach to getting visible, valuable, and connected to your buyers. Um, we we always talk about relationships, which I always just, you know, think is a joke, right? It's like, you know, we all know that sales is about relationships. You know, Jesus walked the earth and, you know, that's you know, his disciples, right? That's what they did. They built relationships and sold you that he was the son of God. We get that. So I think that the, the digital age and what sales reps are really, really bad at is deepening a connection. Um, and the only time that they get the opportunity to deepen a connection is when they get somebody on the phone in most cases, you know, and then some of the, you know, non-mobile, uh, you know, sales people that are doing outside sales, they get to shake your hand. So you used to be able to go to a conference and you'd have to spend a ton of money to do that. But now there's this digital footprint, which you can, you know, engage with people and you can, you can leverage their insights. You can have conversations with them and you can strengthen relationships and that connection, um, and you can do it on multiple channels now, which is even better, right? You know, because everybody, it used to be like, oh, Twitter, what Twitter is around. Well, you know, they're not really active on Twitter. Okay, well then LinkedIn. Well, they're not really active on LinkedIn, Instagram. Now people are starting to get more active on all these different channels, and they're giving you insights into their life. What do they wanna talk about? What's important to them personally and professionally? And as sales reps, we have to use that information along with our selling capabilities to strengthen the connection in the digital uh, digital way because at the end of the day, there's tons of information that we don't need to get and waste somebody's time on the phone with. We can easily deliver that in a Facebook message. Uh, like, you know, Gaetano, how many times, you know, how do, do we do that? Deli start delivering and communicating with people where they live outside of just forcing them to constantly be in your communication medium in sales, which is usually the phone. Yeah, exactly. And I think that gets into the next sort of point I was going to get into for us is like, what are the ways people are doing social selling wrong? And I think the number one way that people are doing it wrong is kind of like what you said, Jack, you know, it's like, hey, here's a piece of content. They comment on it. Hey, you want to talk about our product? It's like, whoa, mm -hmm. whoa, whoa, whoa. Who would ever say anything about that? I mean, Will, what are some of the biggest amateuristic things you see going on uh, in the in the space uh, when it comes to social selling? So I know I'm not the only person that's ever said it this way, but the, there's it's called the opinion as fact syndrome, um, <laughs> where everybody thinks that their way of doing it is the best way of doing it. And it, if you're not open to other people's insights or other people's views or experiences even that you know, calls upon actual evidence that something did or didn't work. So what I often see, and, and it's a it's a, it's tempting. Look, as salespeople, you see someone on a on a comment thread saying, "Oh, you should try out competitor X." It's hard to not be like, "Come on, like talk to me instead." But I think the the mistake that you that you fall victim to is you turn into just a another person with a loudspeaker standing on the corner selling your wares, right? And what I've had success with, and my people on my team, you know, are embracing as well is. If I see someone post something on social and somebody else starts pitch puking all over them in the comment thread, I take the time to take a personalized message and shoot them a note and shoot them an invite and say, look, here's the deal. I think there's a good conversation to have. It's not the forum to do it. Um, I can tell that this stuff is important to you. And I actually even acknowledge the mistakes that other people make. I don't say that person's making a social selling mistake, but I'll say, hey, I, I, look, it's confusing because everybody's telling you how great they are. I'd, I'd rather listen to you, learn a little bit more about what you care about. And again, I pivot off of that social X that allows me to have a more intelligent conversation. But I mean, speaking from experience, it is so hard to not chime in on social when someone is like, oh yeah, that competitor that isn't even around anymore, I use them all the time, they're fantastic. And you're like, ah, right? Um, I don't know, Jack, if you've seen that or if I've seen you on some threads where you've even chastised people about doing the same thing. like. I, I'm not sure what you have to think about that, but. 
I think uh, salespeople, you know, they're trained to do this, right? It's like, how do I get the quick appointment? How do I get the quick sale? Yep. And they don't know any better because they're, you know, they're, a lot of times they're under pressure. The sales leaders are not, you know, giving them what, giving them enough time to do things correctly. The thing is, you know, you you can pick up a phone and it's pretty easy to dial a number and, and cross your fingers and know you play the numbers game. Somebody's going to get on the phone and then at that point, do you have a good enough elevator pitch to keep them on the phone, right? I think the thing that is a little bit, you know, people say social selling is the easy way out. And I always laugh at that because it's it's not. It's absolutely way harder than uh, cold calling because there's you have to understand tools. You have to understand um, the way that you, you know, the art of communication, you know, you have to understand where to go find the right conversations and you have to be super targeted because the thing is, uh, you know, to get on a cold call, you put your phone down, turn off everything else and you pick up the phone. It's, it's pretty easy to just focus on dialing and hope somebody picks up and have a good elevator pitch. But with social selling is you got to turn off everything else and you got to be focused on actually going in and strategically using social as uh, as the sniper as a sniper to be able to get conversations with the right people and then you've got to be smart enough to be able to do that in a way that you can move them offline without you know this cold pitch so i think it just comes down to a lot of this comes down to is there's no fast wins with social and i think that's where a lot of sales people are going wrong because they think it's the vehicle to something fast it's faster to get a conversation with the right person and it's faster to you know, move a conversation offline, which is actually the opposite. There is an art to it and you really have to work for it and stay focused. And most people can't do that. Yeah. I mean, let's get to, let's get to that. I mean, um, you talk about when is the right time to move that conversation offline. And Will, you mentioned uh, there's certain times where threads can get hot, you know, real hot. And, you know, that can be a telltale sign that like, all right, maybe it's not it's not in our best interest from a personal brand and even company brand perspective to battle with somebody or even get, you know, a little feisty on a thread. It's better to just kind of take that back door in there and, and get into the DM. But I mean, well, what, what are there <laughs> what are the best practices are there out there um, in terms of like maybe noticing a specific trigger that might say, all right, I think now is the right time to take this to the right uh, channels, which might be email or phone or, or you know, LinkedIn message. What, what do you think? I mean, Jack's hit on it a couple of times, and I think just to crystallize the way I look at it, like, look, it's all about at-bats, right? Cold calling, personalized email, social selling, like, it's all about at-bats, and then do you swing and miss? Do you swing and hit? And you have to know you're going to swing and miss plenty of times, but you got to step up to the plate and take the at bat, right? So like with social, the right time is always like you've got to be relevant. You got to be timely. You got to be present. You can't just pitch the same thing to everybody. You can't just broadcast as an advertiser on social and hope somebody listens to you. But like you got to experiment. You got to play around, right? So like the right time is usually built around what is the content that's actually being promoted or engaged with on, on social. This is my opinion. Again, try to stay away from the opinion as fact. But in my experience, the most success I've had engaging people that turns into an actual buying journey, like where it's mutually reciprocated that we both believe we can solve the problems at hand, are the ones where I'm not the first one there just saying everything, but I'm there and I'm taking a crack and I'm saying, look, this is something I think it's worth us talking about. Here's why. Here's what I see that you care about, and let's let's talk. Um, I know my style is a little more just human to human, and some other people have to have kind of the repetition type style. Some people would rather be super calculated, but at the end of the day, like the right time is always when someone is engaging with content or promoting content and and finding a way in at that point. All right, that's 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 what I've seen in my experience. Yeah, I agree. It is it is more so a timing thing, and and a lot of that comes like intuitively over time. But Jack, do you have any best practices or tips on, on how to take that conversation from online to offline? Yeah, I think this comes down to. Um, so I I agree with you on the fact that I, I don't think you know you need to have a calculated process where I'm gonna you know, I'm gonna message these five people this way. But I think you know you have to make a commitment to social. So you 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 have to block times off, right? You have to say, okay, if I'm gonna cold call for 45 minutes, then I'm gonna block off 45 minutes to just strictly stay on LinkedIn. And you know, this is where technology is having a process comes in and saying, okay, I'm gonna get into LinkedIn sales navigator. I'm gonna build a prospecting list and I'm going to watch, you know, 45 minutes a day, I'm gonna go through those feeds for those accounts and those people and I'm gonna see what are they sharing? What are they talking about? 
how do I leverage this to start conversation, to deepen the connection and having a process around that? Because really the way that you get offline with somebody is that you have commonality and uh, insights into being able to personalize a message, just like you do it with anything else. But I think, you know, social is the competitive advantage is the insights that you have to be able to personalize your message. If you write a cool email, you know, you don't really know much about them. I mean, you can't, you, it's pretty hard to write a hundred different cold emails to a hundred different people. But on LinkedIn, it's pretty easy to go through LinkedIn sales and go, oh, hey, Will is talking about how they just hired 20 new, you know, sales reps and, they, and they're looking for 20 more. If I'm a recruiter, for example, I'm, I'm going to go to Will and, you know, I'm going to look and see that post and say, hey, Will, you know, just curious, what methodologies have you found for hiring really, good, really good SDRs? Like, wh you know, what are the mediums you're looking on? Oh, you know, we're using recruiters. Da, da, da. Perfect. I'm going to go right to your DM and say, hey, Will, you know what? Amazing that you guys use recruiters. Have you, you know, I would love to give you a shot. Here's three reasons why. Would you be open to that? Right? I mean, you, you're, you're leveraging the insights and the engagement to move that conversation to a DM to essentially give a value prop to move them offline. And I think to that point, like DM direct message is synonymous with social, but like, and again, social amplifiers that allow you to have access to their contact data also help you get it offline, right? So if I see someone on LinkedIn posting something, you know, I'm gonna send them a LinkedIn message and a LinkedIn connect. I don't wanna have to wait though for that connect to happen. I don't have to wait for Navigator to send the message and hopefully they get an alert. I wanna call them right then. But again, it's to that point, that DM is through a couple different media, right? It's either a phone call, an email, or social, maybe all three. Um, and again, that's where- Every single one of those messages is personalized from the conversation exactly. that you had online. And I think that's where a lot of salespeople go wrong is they don't understand. Dude, that's, a, that's an insight moment, right? That's an engagement moment. Because I can tell you right now that you, anybody that comes onto one of my posts and has any type of relevance um, when they ask a question, you know, they ask me for my advice. That's flattery. If you ask somebody for advice, that is flattery. Like, hey, Will, you know, I would love to know how you guys are growing so fast. And what are you doing, man? That, that's, you know, being able to keep up with all those SDRs. Like, Will's going to be like, oh, I'm excited because I want to tell you about this, right? Yeah. And I think if, 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 you know, we always talk about open-ended questions. You know, that's the first thing you're trained in sales is like, open-ended questions, get deeper, get deeper. But the, social media is the same way. I mean, how many sales reps do you see that come on your feed that are trying to sell you that you know, start to open up and ask questions that are relevant to you to get you to start talking? I mean, if you thought about the way that you ask questions during a sales call, the way that you talk about on, uh, on online, and then you use that to, to, to move over to a DM, like you said, and then to send an email if they don't answer your DM within the next you know, 30 minutes, and then you pick up the phone, well, every single one of those things is you now actually have something to have a conversation with somebody about versus sending a cold email, sending a, making a cold call, um, which I call it not a cold call. If you if they know who you are, they have at least some idea of who you are because they just engage with you and they, you have something to, to talk about. Hey, you know, I would love to talk about how you guys are doing this. Right. And you don't even have to pitch. I love I, it. I love and Gaetano, it. that that feels like it's one of the sins that people like cardinal sin seems like a rough way of labeling it. But like I, I as speaking as a new senior manager, people are starting to pitch me more thanks to my title increase on LinkedIn. Right. And I'm, I'm not I'm not trying to be uh, high and mighty and I'm not trying to blow yeah. people off. But if I get one email and that's all I get, I, I don't have time to look at that email and say, I'm yeah. going to take some thought and write back to you. But the people that say, I'm going to send you an email, send you a LinkedIn, leave you a voicemail, be that person that's politely persistent. And again, all triggered around some personalized thing that Jack is talking about. I mean, again, that's that's something that catches all of us. But if you can try to stay ahead of that, that's one of those cardinal rules of don't just do it once or twice, even if it's personalized. Don't fit. Don't take it for granted. Like. And I, that's a whole other webinar, but I use that for recruiting for my team. I use social to recruit people. Yeah. And I have to remember to send them four or five messages before they write back to me, right? Like, that's just the way it is. So. Yeah, exactly. I think, so uh, we do have a question from Rick Herring. I want to get to it in, in a second. Um, but to that point, I personally have never, and I mean ever, responded to somebody who has sent me a prospecting email from a marketing automation or a sales automation tool. Never. I can I can sniff it from a mile away, no matter how personalized it may seem. I have never ever ever responded to ever, not one. 
That's just me though. And this goes to the point. Uh, so let's get to Rick's question. He says, is cold calling a dead technique? And I know there's been a lot of, you know, banter on LinkedIn in the echo chamber about this stuff. But like my personal take on it is that every buyer is different. You're not going to be able to say that cold calling is the only way to reach someone because some CEOs love being cold called because they're not yeah. on social media. They're not checking email. You can cold call them and be successful if you're very good at cold calling. On the flip side of that, there are some CEOs that love email. Like it's weird. Like I sent Rand Fishkin a video once and he was like, dude, why are you sending me videos? I love email. I'm like, oh, I didn't know you loved email. <laughs> like who loves email? You, you like, you know, but you're still in the mindset of like, I hate email. It sucks. Yep. But there are some CEOs that are like, look, email is better. It's right to the point. I don't have to watch a video. It's like, you know, boom, boom, boom. So if you send um, Seth Godin an email, who's my idol, yeah. then he responds to every single email that he's written. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. So, um, no, I, I don't think cold calling is a dead technique. It still works for people who are very good at it. And if your buyers like to be called, it will work. Um, but that's just me. Uh, Will, let me pass it over to you. I, I would love to hear your thoughts on this as well. I love this statement for two reasons. A question statement. I love when people say cold calling is dead on LinkedIn. Number one, cool, because that's less people calling my prospects that I'm going to call. <laughs> right. Two is that Cold calling is the wrong way of labeling it. Cold calling is calling someone you've never talked to before, but it doesn't mean you puke a pitch all over them when you get them on the phone. And it insinuates that you're gonna call a bunch of people all in a call block in a room and put your big headphones on and not talk to anybody. Like, I get that. But cold calling is a necessary utility that goes back to everything we've just talked about. If I know that a prospect of mine is engaging with something on social, and I know that my value completely resonates with the thing they just felt comfortable and confident enough to tell the entire world that they care about, you bet you I'm gonna call them up. I've never talked to them before in my life, but I'm gonna call them. And then it's up to the art, right, of selling a little bit where you're not gonna be able to just say exactly what your company does and why we're different and blah, blah, blah. But like, of course I'm gonna call that person. And again, it's a great question because it's all over LinkedIn and it gets a ton of comments. It's kind of like clickbait at this point. If you do that on LinkedIn, you're gonna get a ton of people to comment on it. But like. I love when people say it. I love when people talk about it. It, it never goes away. It's not going to go away. And it's the competitive edge. I think I even did a post a while ago. It's like cold calling is not dead. You're just not doing it right. Right. Like that's something that we all need to embrace and know that being personalized has to be synonymous with the, the cold outreach, if you will. Jack, I don't know what you think, too, but I mean, it's just semantics. You know, at the end of the day, you know, cold calling is a is a terrible term for something. Um, but I think if you're in sales, like you have to figure out what works for you. Like I never was, I've, I've, I, I was forced to cold call because that was what we were trained to do when I started early in sales. And it's still what most people are trained to do today. But I do believe that as a sales rep, you've got to get really, really good at one or two things. So, you know, where we, where we go wrong is we say that you shouldn't cold call. And we say you shouldn't social sell you shouldn't do this or you should do it all. My personal opinion, maybe do two of them and get really, really good at one of them. You know, I know people that are cold that could cold email and get responses from Fortune 5000 CEOs and I've seen it, right? Like they're just, they're so good at email. You know, I've seen people that can cold call that they would never even think about social selling and I would tell them never to social sell a day in their life because they could pick up the phone and get into a conversation with anybody. Then there's people like me that I know I can use social and I can use it as a sniper. And there's very few times where I've ever not been able to be successful. But you got to become obsessed with getting really good at one thing and using everything to figure out what that is. Um, you know, I'm a firm believer that there's a lot of people that are really good at networking. They can go to an event and, and they could just go to five events in a year and fill their freaking entire pipeline because they're that good at connecting with people at the event and then following up with them and then keeping that relationship going. So I think in sales, we're, we're so focused on, you have to do this one thing that then all of a sudden we just feel, it feels uncomfortable, you know, and, and sales will always feel uncomfortable. If you're new, you should have to absolutely have to get on the phone and feel like an idiot and get told to F off many times because that's what you, that's how you build your, your sales acumen. But I think if you're a little bit farther in your career, you got to really just think to yourself, where is my time best fit? Where do I feel the best about selling? What channel is that? And then you got to really figure out, okay, how do I get even better at that? And then the next step I would say is the personal branding aspect, which is where you become the expert in that so that you never have to beg for business another day in your life. 
Yeah, I love it. I love it. There, there's so many value bombs being dropped left and right, but you, you triggered something for me, Jack. There's one thing in marketing, <clears throat> there's a concept that I think Rand Fishkin put out there called the T-shaped web marketer, where you have all the different channels in marketing and you really need to get like deep expertise in one thing and one channel, but then you also have to have like broad sense of knowledge and all the others. And I think for sales, it's like really no different. Like what you said, you know, like you should be really good at at least one thing, maybe two, but be aware and abreast of all the other things that are out there and then try your hand as you t continue to experiment. I want to get to uh, a question for Will. Um, when it comes to your team and social selling and a team of SDRs or reps that may be reporting to you, what advice would you have for a rep that is really eager and willing to try social selling and wants to try social selling, believes in it, but maybe has like a manager that they report up to, or maybe just an organization that doesn't believe in it. And they, and they, and they want them to really structure their day heavy on the hardcore hit the pavement outbound stuff. Um, because Rick Herring here also said, by the way, thank you guys for your views. Uh, you're welcome, Rick. But he says that um, when he's in this field and, and when he's in this um, this sort of rhythm of cold calling, it's like over and over again, he gets gatekeepers shut down, gatekeepers shut down. And it's like, if you're a rep in this slog of getting gatekeepers shut down from cold calling, how do you how do you uh, make the lobby point to your to your manager that, look, I want to try something different, even though they may not be down with that. So what would you say in response to that, Will? Uh, uh, five second shameless plug, call us, we'll take care of you. Uh, we have 58 million direct dial phone numbers in our database, so number one. But number two, um, I think it's really important to look yourself in the mirror and realize, is this the organization you feel like is going to develop your career, right? There are too many companies, <laughs> there are too many companies and too many sales leaders that have all come from that world. I'm speaking as one of them. I came up in the Darwinian sales floor and a good month for me was outlasting my hiring class. And I'm not kidding, right? That's what it was. And it was three hours of talk time and 200 dials and blah, blah, blah. Um, you, you, life is too short. There are too many great connections to be making out there. Make them through your social networks and, and introduce yourself. Um, again, if you can't get out of that rut, Download a free trial of any of the data providers that say they have direct dials and just start using them and see which ones work. Um, feel pretty comfortable with our customers telling us we have the, the most and the most reliable, but like just try them all. You'll see which ones work for you. Um, but again, most importantly, I think Jack and Gaetano raised their eyebrows and did some fist pumps. Like I, that's how I feel. I'm, I feel very fortunate to work at a company that's one of its main priorities is helping our customer sales and marketing teams do their job more effectively. But sure, I mean, our organization, it, it, I was astounded when I first joined here how many things there were to help a salesperson do their job better. And I was at a company that was like, in my day, we picked up the yellow pages and made phone calls, right? Like there were people that figured out hacks that said, if you dialed zero during a phone tree, you'll get someone live. And then you got to pretend that they're their aunt because their their dog is sick and you got to get them a call. But it's like, there's no time for that. There's too much money to be made out, outside of your company or somewhere else. And I'm not saying that lightly or disrespectfully, but just take a good hard look at where you're at and where you want to be. And I think you'll see a good answer in the mirror. I it's, love it. It's love really it. hard to fix a, a laggard mindset in sales. I mean, if you've got a guy or a gal that's been in sales for 30 years and they've done millions and millions and sometimes billions of dollars in sales and they've done it the one way and they're managing you, good luck. It, 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 nine out of 10 times is not going to change. Then, you know, I think there is a little self-reflection you have to do as a sales rep is like, you know, am I doing all the right things? Um, to at least say that that I'm not the problem, right? Because, right. you know, and you probably get this as a sales manager, Will, is like the, the easy way out as a sales rep is to like, you know, always blame your, your leadership. So if you've gotten past that point and you know that you, you're you not the problem, then you've got you to move on and you got to be really, really smart about where you go to sell because, you know, coaching is everything. You know, social selling, I've always said this, that sales leaders should be social selling for one reason because, they, they're the one, they're the role model there. That's coaching. If you're, if you're using LinkedIn correctly as a sales leader, you're setting the bar for your salespeople. Now, how many sales leaders, which is rare, do you see that use LinkedIn or do it correctly? So how the heck would their salespeople know who to follow or what lead to take? Um, so, you know, there's many things, ways to think about it, but I do think you really, this goes back to one thing, one thing only, what, what figure out and try everything and figure out what you're the most comfortable with and where you get the most success. And then find an organization that that believes in that.
and we'll coach you. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. So um, that, that actually reminds me of why I joined Sales Hacker because I was really excited to, uh, you know, I, I told Max in the beginning, like, look, this got to go my way, baby. We, we got to do the things that I want to do. Like, I felt like all the other organizations I was at before were great, great for learning. But at the end of the day, it's like we didn't always quite see eye to eye strategically and like getting eye to eye strategically with the company you're going to be joining is, is critical. Uh, let's get into some more stuff. Um, let's talk about like social selling success. Um, so Will, let's 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 go to you for a second. Are there any reps on your team or anyone in your organization that is doing social selling exceptionally well, crushing it? And do you have any examples of maybe a deal, a big deal that you can share? Um, maybe some numbers, maybe some brands, I don't know, uh, that have originated from social selling and you can point that attribution back to a conversation that was started on social and then how did that you know transpire and translate all the way down the funnel so to speak into a close sure um i'll give a shout out to he was our mvp last year um his name is pat shea he does a, an awesome job of really focusing on where his time will be most returned back to him if you will um, and he's super, super selective on who he engages and he makes people know that when he reaches out to them. Um, but it, just like I've been talking about, he does it in a subtle enough way, right? He engages with content and understands content, but doesn't need to be the one who's loudest or most seen on the comment thread or the like engagements or whatever. He just pounces. Um, and you know, again, I, I kind of, I agree. I'm, I, I believe that you should be showing others what you hope that they'd be doing and Again, not because you're going to get them to do what you want, but you're going to help them see a path of this could help you do X. So I, I do a lot of LinkedIn thought stuff and promote content. Um, but there was this one time that this person reached out. He's like, hey, so I've been getting these emails from Pat Shea and, you know, they're relevant and I get it. But I'll be honest with you. I'm just going to cut to it. We're in the finish line with one of your competitors. I'll be polite and classy and not throw them out there. But we're at the finish line. Can you beat them? And he sent that to me in a LinkedIn message. And, you know, if Pat hadn't been reaching out to him, hadn't selected the right account, hadn't thought enough about which account to go after. And if I hadn't been promoting content on LinkedIn, who knows if he would have reached out to us at all, let alone me. He didn't want to trial. He didn't want to talk to qualifying teams. He just went, can you beat him? And we did. And, you know, we've renewed him a couple of years over and they're a really happy customer of ours. So, you know, I, I thought that was a, a pretty, pretty awesome example that we're trying to repeat on over and over here. Yeah, and that goes back to, to Jack's mantra of be visible, valuable, and connected. Like if you're if your guys aren't out there uh, sharing valuable content on on LinkedIn and all these places, it's like how do they even think of you? You know what I mean? Like they don't even know you exist. Like we did that too. What like Sales Hacker? We were gonna we were um, evaluating a new marketing automation tool. We were trying to figure out if we were gonna go with Active Campaign or uh, SendGrid. And uh, it came down to the fact that like we were going to use SendGrid, but we we're thinking like, oh, we really like Active Campaign too. Let's just, and I did exactly what that person did to you. I, I messaged like their head of sales and I'm like, look, can you beat this deal? Can you get us something more affordable? And they're like, yeah, we can do it. And then done. It was done like that. Um, so Jack, let's go, let's go to you for a second, man. You're obviously a, a very, very, very good social seller. Um, it takes, I think, a lot of years of experience and practice to get to the level that you're at, but is there anyone on, on social that you see really doing well? And maybe can you share uh, some deals that you know have closed maybe from creation agency or some of your partners um, that have been attributed back to social? Yeah, so, you know, I can speak um, to a lot of different stories, but I'll, I'll speak to my own because I think um, this is relatable. So I was a regional sales manager at Acton uh, for three and a half years and Acton, was a startup at the time. So uh, when I came in, you know, not a lot of people knew who Acton was. And uh, I remember telling my VP of sales, like, hey, like we're selling the we're, we're selling the wrong way. Like we're selling to marketers um, and, and we're selling to them on the channels that we're trying to sell. We're not selling to them on the channels that we're actually trying to sell them on our tool for. So I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. Right. So like we're going to say that you know, you should use a marketing automation platform for social, for email and stuff like, why aren't we using our own channels from the platform to actually get into the conversation with them? Because that's where a lot of marketers live. So um, he he had said to me, you know what, Jack, um, and in a laughing manner, not believing that I would do it, he said, well, I'll give you one quarter to figure it out. So like, you don't have to follow the metrics, but I don't want you to, I don't want you to tell everybody this, 
But um, so, you know, from that day on, I made it a, a mission that I was like, I'm not going to cold call. I'm not going to do 150 dials a day. It just didn't make sense to me. And um, I hit my quota over and over and over, went to President's Club. And it was, I was doing 80% of social media was how I was setting my appointments. And I would say that it was influencing, and I wrote a post about this, you know, uh, over a million and a half dollars worth of, of sales at the time that I was there. So I know it works from a personal perspective. Now, then I went on to, um, you know, to open up the U.S. division of a global agency. And I, we don't, I don't do any outbound. Like, we don't do any, not, not one outbound campaign. We have 21 clients in the last two years um, that are, you know, nice size clients. And it's all through outbound engagement or inbound referrals through content. So we, I live this this day to day. Now, the difference between me and an average sales rep is that, well, I was an average sales rep, right? So I'm just like you. And I started to write, you know, LinkedIn publishes, LinkedIn content. And I started to say, you know what? I'm a long-term sales rep. I don't want to just, you know, beg for business. I want people to come to me and say, wow, I want to talk to you because you are the guy that can solve my problems because you're so visible, you're so valuable, and I feel so connected to you that that I want to figure out how we can do business together. So that's the long-term story of me, and, and I just scale it. I don't have big budget. Like creation agency, you know, my company, I don't put a lot of money behind me. I just do me. Like I do this and I'll curate this. So I think, you know, we have to think long term as salespeople. Are we a long term salesperson or are we a short term salesperson? And then that's the success story that we have to figure out as to what we want to be. And then we have to work with leadership to say, here's what my plan is. Like, I want to be here and I want to be a manager. And here's how I want to try to do this. And, you know, you have to be at a place where management's open enough to say, OK, here, you have a quarter to figure this out. Right. I'm not going to bust your your butt on normal metrics but i can tell you that a good sales rep or a long-term one or one that aspires to be if you go and then you make a commitment you better make sure you hit that commitment but it works if you work it and i, I have millions of dollars from my own personal story in revenue to tell you but i could show you multiple other people um, and i can give you one one of the best stories i have a client right now um, he's a sales leader and he is doing a podcast. I've been telling him forever. I'm like, you are one of the smartest dudes in sales coaching. You start a podcast and you bring on all of the best practitioners and sales leaders at all the best companies um, at Fortune 500, Fortune 5000 that nobody knows who they are. And I want you to get every little nugget out of them because I'm sure Will would love to hear from a C, uh, VP of sales at Waste Management how he scaled a multi-million dollar SDR team, right? So I said, you're going to do this. And I said, you're going to be very, very selective about who you bring on. You're not going to bring on influencers because everybody's sick of hearing the same 25 people, including probably me, talk on a webinar or a podcast. You're going to bring them on. You're going to give them actionable strategies. But the thing is, you're going to be very, very selective about it. You're going to only bring on people that you want to do business with, right, that have a good story. He's done 25 podcast episodes. And I asked him the other day, how many of those and I call this social selling, right? To me, this is pure social selling because he reached out to him on LinkedIn, booked the appointment, got him on a podcast. Next thing you know is it. He's in a sales conversation with all 18. And I asked him, how many of those 18 out of the 25 people did you have to ask to see your product? And he said, not one. After I got off of every single podcast, the first thing they said to me is, how do we find out we can work together? And he's a I Fortune mean, 500, I mean, Fortune 5000. That is a success story. And I'll tell you that yeah, there, yeah. we're going to do a case study on that and tell you how much pipeline was generated and deals closed. Yeah. And that, that's what it's all about right there. It's like, you know, not one was product focused. It was like, how can we start working together? How can we help one another? And then it all comes from there. Um, we have a question from Lee, Lee Perrine. Um, and I, I think this is a very, very valid question. Um, he wants to know, like, there's a lot of reps on his team or maybe um, novice people who are not very active on LinkedIn. They don't know how to get started. They're very new or they're, um, they're, they're afraid to put themselves out there and stuff like that. Sorry about that. My uh, wind just closed my door. Sorry about that. Um, but, yeah, what are some actionable tips you can share for reps who are maybe uh, inactive or uh, inexperienced with, with this whole thing and they, they want to get started, they're just not really sure how. Um, I know for, for me, the number one tip I always give is Quora. Quora has some of the best um, 
knowledge out there um, in any subject. And there's tons of really good questions that people really want to know the answers to. If you do a site colon search in Google uh, with Quora.com and then the keyword that you're looking for. So let's say like it's uh, how do I find phone numbers or something like that. Like in Quora, there's tons of threads on that. You can go in, answer one of those questions, post what your answer was to LinkedIn and get conversation started that way. That's always like an easy one-off thing that I, I always recommend to people to get started. But maybe Lee and, uh, maybe Jack and Will, you can help, help Lee out here as well, give them some, uh, some advice. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer too. And, you know, I'm a big believer in figuring out why you're doing what you're doing because everything else will happen because of that. So, you know, at, at its core, people buy from people pretty objectively because there's empathy and rapport that's developed based on an understanding of a problem or an obstacle they try to overcome, right? So, I mean, how to get started, like genuinely understand why you're in sales, <laughs> first of all, what goals that can help you accomplish, second of all, and then allow that to trickle down to everything you do. If you genuinely come across to someone via a LinkedIn message or an email, and say, hey, look, I, I'm, I, I know in the back of my head I'm trying to save for a house, right? So I need to close some business this, this quarter and this year to save up enough for a down payment, right? So everything I do is going to be built towards that. My message out to this person is going to be genuine because I know that if I'm not genuine, I'm not going to create that conversation. I'm not going to create an opportunity out of a conversation. I'm not going to close revenue, right? So social, I think it's kind of cool. This is like maybe a meta way of thinking about it, but social selling is synonymous with social media. Social selling is creating an empathic relationship with someone built off some mutual understanding of value and then pivoting off of that and yeah, selling something and closing some business, but solving that problem for that person that you both kind of bonded over. And that's where I would start. And, and really that again, I, I manage my team that way. Like I'm not all about your day to day activity. I'm about what your goals are because you're smart and you're going to figure out what you need to do to get there. And I'll coach you up when you want me to be there and I'll help you close deals and I'll help you look at game film to figure out why we missed or what we missed on. But like the ways to get started or to be yourself and allow yourself to come through and build that good empathy and rapport that develops that relationship that gets you business, right? That, that's the way I look at it. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And those are all things that like you never really pick up as a sales rep when it comes to cold calling. Like cold calling is is very meticulous and like there's scripts and formulas and all these things you can do to try to right. increase your chances of somebody being interested. But like that's why social is a lot harder. Like Jack said, people want to know like social selling is so easy. You just share some content and start talking to people like, nah, that's not how it works. Um, but anyway, Jack, what are, what are some of your top tips for novice or inexperienced people that want to get started and want to get the ball rolling on this, but they just really don't know where to start. So I'm a huge fan of what uh, Tony Robbins calls modeling, right? So the modeling um, methodology. So uh, the first place to start is learning. I think the number one reason that sales reps suck is because they don't have enough wisdom in their brain to have a real conversation. It's not that they don't have a conversation. They just don't understand how to, they don't, they can't talk to a CEO who's, who's, or a VP who's been in the, the industry for 30 years and knows the ins and outs and you know they've been in sales for one year trying to get their time which is you know don't get it mixed up the most valuable thing a buyer has is not their is not their money everybody gets stuck on that when they're new in sales it's their time because I would rather pay you than spend time with you <laughs> like it's just the way it is right I mean that's why we, we use Uber right we, we, we use all these apps because all we're trying to do is save time we don't care about how much the Uber costs so you got to understand that so what you're playing is a time game in sales and you have to go and use the social platforms to understand how you can fill your brain with enough wisdom and information so that you can give somebody value on their time. And I think that's where you really need to think about as a sales rep is in your industry. Do you know enough is the reason you're having bad conversations because you just don't know enough on how to have a good conversation. So start there, go find the people in your industry that are the industry leaders and I want you to follow them on social media, follow their page on LinkedIn, and consistently spend and block off 30, 30 um, minutes a day where you just learn, just sponge. And the thing that will happen is, now you start to take that information, and when you find something that's really, really good, what I want you to do is I want you to take it and I want you to share it on LinkedIn. Force yourself to read five articles and to share two to three of those per day. Start there, that's the most basic level, because you're gonna be killing two birds with one stone. One is you're going to be feeding your brain with more wisdom, um, which is going to make it a habit for you to be 
wanting to get on LinkedIn because now you have a, you, you're finding that hook, right? What's that hook is you're going to get obsessed with learning more about your information, more information about your industry. Then your second thing is you're going to get into a habitual process of sharing two to three nuggets. And the thing is, if you're sharing the right content, you'll start the right conversations because a CEO that sees somebody share something that could help them personally and professionally over and over and over, you start to get, they start to go, ah, I kind of know who that person is. That's the key to social selling. You know, somebody asked me, what, is, what does it mean to cold email somebody? And I said, that's when you send me something and I don't know that you exist, right? But if you, sh if you get connected to me and you do this process, baby steps, learn or follow, learn and share, and you get connected to the right people, you do this over and over. When you pick up the phone, you'll have a really good shot that they know you exist. And now you've completely shifted the odds of whether or not you're gonna be able to move that thing forward. Completely, completely agree. I mean, there's there's so many examples of people that I'm like friends with now that tried to sell me something through social, but it didn't work out, but we remain friends because they share tremendous value all the time. And it's like, this person is worth following. And then what do you know, I'll share some of his or her stuff and then more people will see that person through my network and then maybe that will lead to something. So even indirectly, there's like this flywheel effect that eventually starts to happen once you're consistent well, enough, like Jack said. And I'm gonna cut you off real quick because this yeah. is the one thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is that I can't tell you how many referrals that I get from social media. From yeah. People I have yeah. no idea who they are. They go, Jack, you know what? I've been reading, you know, the stuff you've been sharing and I have a friend or an uncle that is in this space. Um, you know, I'm a homemaker, I'm, I'm retired, but I just love what you do. And I think you, you know, you guys would, he, you'd be able to help him. Can I warn lead you? Like yeah. you, there's yeah. so many indirect, there's so much indirect um, things that happen to you from, from a, a sales standpoint and sales conversations by just being visible, valuable and connected to all the wrong people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You'd be surprised. Yeah, exactly, exactly. One of my one of my uh, top tips for reps who are trying to get started with this stuff and they're they're kind of struggling of, of where to start or where to find the right content to share, your own company blog. Go to your company blog. There there should be, I hope, some decent stuff there. You might be able to extract a little little story or at least the key takeaways. Just the key takeaways. You put it as a story in your LinkedIn newsfeed. And you get conversation started around that. That's the easiest low-hanging fruit. I mean, you don't even have to think too hard. That's going to take you less than like five minutes to put together. So that that's one of my most actionable, uh, practical tips for you there. But I want to get um, back to Will for a second. Um, when it comes to – Will, you, you, you very lightly scratched on this, but let's get a little bit more into it as we wind down here. Your reps that are selling on social – how do you, how do you or do you um, give them like a certain number of uh, requirements to hit? Are there KPIs, um, or do you kind of just follow the mantra of like, look, you can't control your outcomes; you can only control your activities. So, is there a certain amount of social selling activity that you say this is like the required amount of commitment that you have to do to be successful? How how does that work for you guys at uh, Zoom Info? Candidly, no. And okay. I know I'm a, I'm a, no, a new school type of a manager, I guess, is that I kind of buck the KPI model in the first place. But I've, I've built a couple tenants for our team that I care about. And again, that's my theme is how you get there. I trust that you're going to figure out if your results don't show like Jack's story. I'm going to give you a quarter and then we're going to do it my way. Right. But my way is going to support what the goals are that you have anyway, because you're my customer, if you will. Right. But my my core values I care about are opportunity generation, pipeline creation. Paying attention to average order size because I don't want you working a bunch of opportunities that are at the lowest tier. Self-sourced, created opportunities, right? Not just any opportunity that comes through an inbound channel. All of those, those are valuable. But self-sourced, generated opportunities. How good are we at engaging our audience? And then I pay attention to close rate. Not win rate, but close rate because I want to make sure I can reverse engineer the pipeline. So how we get there, I'm good with. Like however you can get there, I, I'm good. Um, I have best practices, like I know if I look up people that use Outreach.io and are talking about Outreach.io or SalesLoft on LinkedIn, and people are engaging with content about evaluating those tools, and I use ZoomInfo, I can get that person on the phone in two seconds, right? Because I'll have their direct line in their email, and I'll have a perfectly relevant message. And I give people that as a weapon to add to their tool belt, 
but I'm not going to say you got to make you know 30 LinkedIn messages a day and I got to watch you because number one, there's no way I can manage that. I have 13 people working for me. Number two, I don't want to manage that to an expectation that if you do that, it's going to be the thing that helps you be successful because I don't know that that's true to Jack's point. You might be better at cold calling. You might be better at promoting content. I don't know. Um, but again, I just give people the ability to see, yeah, if, you, if you're if you're using LinkedIn the right way um, or shoot, I just got a, <laughs> a recruiter sent me a direct message on Twitter that was three lines like three, three words, no grammar, no caps. It was like, are you in sales? And I was like, yeah, I'm in sales. And two minutes later, I had a LinkedIn message from the recruiter being like, want to move to Idaho? Here's a job that we have. And she worked for the same company. I'm like, no, thank you. But that's super creative because I looked up her profile three or four times. She probably saw that. And she probably told the other lady, send me an email. Like, do I need to have my reps telling me how many times they did that a day? No, I just care about that they create the conversation and that they create opportunities and pipeline for us to close, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. That, that, and I agree with that total, like it's, you can't say you gotta, you know, do 20 DMs a week or this or that, cause then you're just spraying and praying and it's no different than uh, sitting in a, in a sweatshop and, and hitting the phones. Right. <laughs> uh, Jack, any, any yeah. last thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think um, everything in sales starts and ends with a conversation. Where that conversation, you know, I think this is where the laggard sales mindset has to shift is like where that conversation starts doesn't matter, right? We all know it's going to finish in a conversation or in a handshake, which actually maybe not true anymore with e-signatures and stuff. I mean, I just closed a deal the other day when I sent the, the link to the contract in Facebook Messenger. So, you know, maybe it's shifting a little <laughs> bit more. You know, <laughs> just odd to say that. But, you know, nine out of ten times we have a the sales process like it actually is getting easier like everybody always says it's getting more complex and i'm like no it's getting easier because there's so many different ways to communicate with somebody like i mean you know the guy's traveling he's on the air he's on an airplane when was the last time you could close deals or have communication with somebody that travels on an airplane now they have wi-fi on the airplane like i'm like emailing people back and forth on facebook messenger so really start to to quit thinking about how you you know how you think you should communicate with your buyers and just start, you know, asking them, you know, on sales calls, like, hey, are you somebody that likes to talk on the phone? Like, you know, I want to, I want to move this forward, but like, I know there's some gaps. There's going to be some time gaps in here where I'm going to, you're going to need some stuff from me. Where do you want me to send that? You'll be surprised where somebody say, ah, just send it through email, right? Oh, you know what? I, you know, I see that you're super active on LinkedIn. Would you just like me to, you know, shoot it through there? Where, where do you want that? Start asking people, where do they love to communicate? and start giving them the communication where they live. And actually, you'd be surprised, it might actually alleviate a ton of your time of being on freaking phone calls all day. Because I can tell you, I hate being on phone calls all day. <laughs> There's so much things I know I can do without having to spend 30 minutes on the phone with somebody. I agree, I'm, I'm not a phone guy either. Um, <laughs> uh, Will, any, any last uh, thoughts on that before we move to, I guess, one final question? No, go ahead. All right, awesome. So. Um, is it possible to actually secure the deal, close it in social? Because this is the thing that everyone says is not possible. They, they think you can only get to a certain part with the social in the funnel. You can only get them to the, you know, the, the to sort of the top. You know, you can engage them, but then you gotta move them to a phone call, then you gotta work the deal that way. But is it actually possible to use social only to get them all the way to the end and close them, send them that that contract through LinkedIn. Like, have you guys done this? Is it possible? Will I'll, I'll push it to you first, man. So my answer to this, I'm not I'm not evading your question, but my answer to this is yes, because you're going to close the conversation, the deal, on your first conversation. Okay. Your ability to listen to somebody, understand their problem, understand how bought in philosophically the organization is to solving that problem and what the impact of not solving that problem is, happens during what we like to call discovery, okay? And discovery can happen on social because they might give you everything you need to know, right? Somebody comments on a post about, well, I'm looking into marketing automation systems and I'm really curious to know what everybody thinks because we're trying to go into the digital channel via email. What do I need to know more than that? And I get you on the phone and I understand exactly what you need. I, I sell in a territory, SMB, where we have a lot of first-time buyers, 
We have a lot of internal procedures and people that get involved in the process at the very end on purpose because they don't have time to get in, in the process during the sales cycle. And I came from a job where I was like, if I don't have the key decision maker, I'm not talking to it. It's not the way the world works anymore, right? And the only time you're probably going to hear from the signer is the day they call you and say your price doesn't work because you didn't listen on discovery and you didn't solve the problem on discovery. So it's not a silver bullet. Again, not opinion is fact, but during discovery using social and connecting with someone at the exact right time via email, phone, however, making sure you have that conversation, that's what tells you how likely you are to close the deal. That's what we talk about on our sales team all the time. What are your likelihood of winning based on how well you listened and understood where your solutions aligned to the obstacles they're facing? I don't need a two week sales cycle to figure that out. My favorite buying conversations are when the decision maker chimes in and is like, why are we even still talking about this? This is a no brainer, right? They solved our problem. I don't need to do a trial or a demo or use the tool. Why don't we just do this? Because I know they listened to me and they solved my problem, right? Um, I, I tend to oversimplify, but I truly, truly believe, and I've seen that evidenced well over almost all the deals that we close and win in the right way, right? Yeah, I love it. I, I agree with that a lot. Jack, any any final thoughts on that one? Well, I think you Tato would agree with me on this. So like, it depends on your deal size, but I can't tell you how many people, like, let's just say uh, an SEO tool, for example, like, you know, I'll use you for example, like Gaetano does not need you to get on a phone and pitch him your SEO tool. He needs you to send him a link and give him five minutes because he knows SEO tools so well. So I think um, depending on your deal size, especially if it's a smaller SaaS product where you could do a trial or something, um, people are looking for this stuff. And so this is why sales chat and drift is blowing up in my personal opinion is because um, a lot of people, they don't, if it's $19.99 a month or $99 a month or something like that, like they don't need to talk to you. They already know they've been using something else and they're coming. Most likely it's a free tool. They're coming to look for you to see what the next level up is. They already know what it feels like or what it needs to feel like, what features it needs to have. So I think you really got to be smart when you have a smaller SaaS product of how easy do you make it for people to buy? Like how easy is it? Like how easy is it for me to get, my answer right now, because I've just been in your tool, I'm almost sold, but I just need to ask one question on chat real quick. You know, can you do, can it do X, Y, and Z? That's the one thing I'm missing. Oh yeah, go to this link. Okay, perfect, boom, here's my credit card. That's how we buy it out, like yeah. it is what yeah. it is. I mean, the, unless you're in a complex deal or sale, then that's a completely different thing. You have to be on the phone, you have to go fly to meet them, but that's understanding your product and your buyer and making it easy for them to buy. Yeah, I agree with that completely. And even like, you know, during my time at Pipe Drive, it's like a SMB company that's trying to fill five CRM seats. They don't they don't need to talk to anybody. In in the event that it's a really big deal, like they want to roll out the CRM to like 50 plus seats, then yeah, maybe they're going to want to talk to someone. But it's not just the pricing, but the volume of the deal and the size of how many reps are going to be using the product and so forth. That all matters a lot. But yeah, back to the SEO tool thing, like. I, you know, even for a $200 a month product, I don't need to talk to anybody, nor do I want to. Let me see it. <laughs> Let me, you know, if I have to chat you, I'll chat you. But at the end of the day, it's like I can figure this stuff out in two seconds. And now with, you know, G2 Crowd and Captera and all these things, it's like, you know, you don't need uh, to talk to, you don't really need to talk to a rep to know the little intricacies of, of something. So that just creates friction in the process for the most part. Um, all right. Well, I guess we're out of time. That That's a wrap for us today. Uh, Jack and Will, man, you guys have been great. This has been, uh, I think, one of the best webinars we've had on this topic for a while. We actually haven't done that many on social selling, but this one has been a very open and honest conversation. And um, I think you guys were uh, willing to speak and say things that not other people have or would be willing to say. So for you guys in the audience, you, you got the real deal stuff today. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. We got a lot of people chatting in the box saying this has been awesome. So um, thanks again. Uh, so Will, uh, where can people connect with you? Where can they find you? Uh, let them know all that. Find me on LinkedIn. I, I usually accept most connection requests. Um, it's for Tini, F-R-A-T-T-I-N-I. -T -T -I. People sometimes mess up the spelling of my name. Um, they can absolutely reach out to me at my email, will.pertini at ZoomInfo. Um, Pitch me, email me, whatever you want to do. Um, I'd love <laughs> cold to connect. Call. So. <laughs> yeah, or they can uh, try Zoom Info to get your phone number and cold call you. But That's right. given, that, given that this is a social selling uh, webinar, they would be uh, hard pressed to not do that, and they should hit you up in the DM. Uh, Jack, where can they find you, man? 
um, anywhere, you know, practice what I preach. And, uh, you know, I'm always open to conversation if you have a question. Exactly. And same here. Just hit me up on LinkedIn, given this is social selling and Jack and I are pretty active on LinkedIn. You can hit us up there. Uh, you're welcome, Mario. We have another person that said this was one of the best webinars. So thank you guys. Appreciate it very much. And um, we'll catch you next time. Until then, peace.